Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to our Expressing, Storing, and Feeding Breast Milk webinar sponsored by Isis Parenting, Medela, and Bravado and presented by Nancy Holtzman. My name is Cindy Meltzer and I'm the Director of Community and Social Media here at Isis and I'll be your moderator this evening. During this hour-long presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. We're hoping most of your questions will be answered during Nancy's information pack session. If you do have questions at the end, we'll take them as time allows. Any questions we can't get to, you're welcome to ask them at our weekly breastfeeding chat that takes place every Thursday at noon, and we'll provide you with a link to that chat. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording in the next 48 hours. So if you miss something or need to step away to tend to your baby, that's okay. ICE Parenting is proud to host this evening's webinar, ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. Let me tell you a little bit about our co-sponsors for this presentation, Medela and Bravado. Medela offers a complete line of breastfeeding products so mom can provide what's best for her baby even when she's not there. Bravado is the brand women ask for by name. Bravado's unparalleled knowledge and expertise in both nursing mothers and bras has resulted in a range of exceptional products that encompass quality, function, comfort, and style. As I mentioned, I'm Cindy Meltzer and I'll be your moderator tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for the evening, Nancy Holtzman. Nancy Holtzman is a maternal infant specialist, board certified lactation consultant, and certified pediatric nurse. She has spent over 20 years working with new families in the Boston area and speaks and writes nationally on topics ranging from breastfeeding and pumping to infant development and sleep. Nancy is the original founder of Great Beginnings, a program that has supported well over 12,000 Boston area new mothers in the past 15 years. And she's a clinical founder of ISIS Parenting. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Cindy. So to get started, I just want to put out there, is it worth it, all of the time and effort that you're putting into expressing milk if you are returning back to work or separated from your baby? And I really think it is. Just like in retrospect, moms don't typically say, gee, I really wish I'd gone back to work sooner. Moms generally don't say, oh, I really wish I'd stopped breastfeeding or stopped pumping two weeks earlier. Uh, one thing we know about breast milk is it really is dose dependent. Uh, some is better than none, and more is better than some, and any is better than none. But pumping may be the tool that allows you to continue breastfeeding at the end of a workday or on the weekends and certainly cuddling on a lazy morning in bed. And pumping milk when you're at work can help reduce some of the inevitable mom conflicted feelings about returning to work. And pumping can really help you feel connected to your baby if your baby is away from you, whether it's in daycare or maybe in the NICU. Breast milk is something really special that only you can provide for your baby. And in this image here, you see um, this little icon from the 70s, the Pac-Man guy. And I really like to include that in some of these informational slides because to me that represents uh, some of the health benefits of breast milk. It's phagocytosis, which is a cell that you might remember way back in high school biology class. But this is the guy, the little Pac-Man guy, that searches for bacteria and viruses in your baby's body and gobbles them up. Down below you see an actual uh, phagocyte, a white, white blood cell that has a sticky exterior, and that's an actual virus stuck to it. So when your baby is in a daycare environment and exposed to so many germs, your baby will get sick. But statistically, breastfeeding is going to reduce the risk of ear infections, GI infections, um, respiratory hospitalizations, and a myriad of other uh, illnesses. So to get started, 
people think, okay, well, let's just pull out the pump and get started talking about how to pump your milk. But really the best way to get started being successful pumping and storing your best milk is to get started with breastfeeding. So when possible, if you can focus just on get, getting breastfeeding well established during the first two to three weeks before even worrying about pumps and bottles, that's the way to do it. If everybody at the time of birth is stable and healthy, ask to have your baby placed directly skin to skin, and that's the very best place for your baby to transition to life outside the uterus. And even in the uh, operating room, after a C-section now, many hospitals are promoting skin to skin right there in the OR. And within the first hour on your chest, your baby may or may not latch on, and they may lick or nuzzle or just rest, and that's okay. It's what I call being at the table, so they may not necessarily eat. When breastfeeding is going well in your home, nursing your baby on request is the best way to stimulate a full milk supply. Don't worry that your baby might be overfeeding or what people call using you as a pacifier uh, because that's not the case. Babies don't use mom as a pacifier. A pacifier is a substitute for the mother's breast. So it's kind of the other way around. Um, babies have very few hobbies when they're brand new, and breastfeeding is one of the most relaxing and enjoyable ways for them to spend their time. It makes them feel safe and secure, and it's good for them. And think about it this way. To a newborn, it's a big adjustment from being in utero and having womb service, 24 hours around the clock feeding. They're never hungry, 24-7. They're getting nutrition. And now that they're born, they have to adjust to only eating 8 or 10 or 12 times in 24 hours. So to them, it feels like a big cutback. Uh, to us, it's exhausting. To them, uh, they, have, they have experiences that they didn't have in utero where they practice drinking and swallowing. Uh, but um, on the outside, they have to be hungry, they have to be full, they have to um, have GI sensations that they didn't have in utero. So babies need a lot of comforting, and they, they often will get comfortable at the breast. They need to eat early and often, and the more they eat, the more milk you'll make. So in the early days, you really can't overfeed your newborn. During the, the first, uh, I would say, six weeks or so, if your baby is happiest just nursing and dozing at the breast, then that's fine. Uh, don't worry that you're creating a bad habit. If your baby spits up a lot and you're worried that you're overfeeding, that, they are, that they're getting too much milk, then try what's called block feeding and just keep putting the baby back on the same breast over and over, uh, over a period of time if they want to be cluster feeding. And that way they get a little bit less milk volume but higher fat milk and sometimes that will help with the spit up. And if you have sore nipples and so you're dreading having the baby spending more time at the breast, then please get help and get that resolved because uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't have to hurt. It may be a little uncomfortable initially, but it shouldn't hurt and there shouldn't be damage. Um, so in the perfect world, the baby is born, crawls up, latches on, and everybody goes nursing off into the sunset. But in real life, it doesn't always happen that way. And as a lactation consultant, of course, I see more, uh, more often people that, that things are not going smoothly. So that's what we'll talk about next because uh, you really do need a breastfeeding contingency plan. And there are many paths to breastfeeding and a lot of reasons why a baby may not be able to start breastfeeding right after birth. And uh, there may be complications either on the baby's end or on the mom's end. Very common, babies are sleepy or maybe they come a few weeks early. So uh, they're quite sleepy and sluggish or they come uh, four or eight weeks early and so they need some special care and monitoring. And uh, often babies are jaundiced and that makes them uh, slower and harder to feed. Uh, babies may have oral anatomy issues, like you can see this baby that has a tongue tie. Uh, all of these things can uh, create challenges getting started with breastfeeding. So the critical point I want to make is that it's okay if breastfeeding doesn't happen during the first hour or even the first days. It does not mean that breastfeeding won't ever happen. So you must have a breastfeeding contingency plan and you have to have a long-term mindset and realize it's not make or break. So if breastfeeding doesn't happen the first day and even the second day and they're talking about having you being discharged home from the hospital and the baby is not yet latched on and they want you to start bottle feeding, don't feel like that's it. You're not going to be a breastfeeding mom and it's all over for you. Uh, you may need to kind of take a staged approach. So uh, it's important that you understand breast milk is use it or lose it. If for whatever reason the baby is not coming to the breast and latching, then moms do need to begin moving the milk. So one way or another, the baby has to eat, and one way or another, you need to establish that milk production. So in the beginning, it's what's called manual expression because the colostrum is thick like honey, 
and a breast pump is not going to draw that out of the breast easily. So we use massage and uh, manual expression, and you see these little drips and drops and smears of colostrum, which is like honey, which is so important for your baby's immune system that even premature babies in the NICU who aren't able to drink or to eat orally yet, uh, they'll still use the colostrum even for oral care for these little 28-week uh, babies because it's so critical for their immune system. Um, a hospital-grade pump starting around the second or the third day in combination with manual expression will help move the colostrum and uh, establish the beginnings of milk supply. And sometimes moms do go home expressing milk and feeding the milk to the baby with the bottle. But the most important things are rule number one, feeding the baby and getting everybody healthy, and then rule number two, initiating and then maintaining milk production. And when those two things are happening, you have the time to put those pieces of the puzzle together. And it may take a few days, or sometimes in certain situations it can take a few weeks. But the pieces of the puzzle can come together, and often do, down the road. So talking about choosing your pump, I did an article about this uh, uh, recently where I highlighted the different types of pumps and who they might be best I ideal for. A manual pump is really going to be designed for somebody who's going to be pumping quite infrequently. Um, it's handy if uh, during the earliest days, if you have fullness in, in your breast before breastfeeding, a manual pump is small, lightweight, and not complex. So it's easy to even express milk for a minute or two, which can help draw the nipple out and make latching a little bit easier and um, can um, is, is handy, too, if you're traveling. It's an easy thing to put in your purse or your backpack if you need to. Um, but it's not really ideal for someone who's going to be doing a moderate amount of pumping. Um, you also see in this slide a single automatic breast pump. And um, although there are, there are some uh, good quality, I generally don't recommend those because people will spend uh, $150 on a single automatic breast pump and still find that uh, bottom line they wish that they had spent just a little bit more and got a double automatic breast pump. And so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the different double automatic breast pumps because at least in, with the moms I work with, these are really the pumps uh, that will meet the needs of a, of a mom who needs to pump several times a day or who is going back to work or is pumping for a baby due to an illness or a separation. So a uh, double automatic breast pump means you can pump both breasts at the same time, and that's really important because the double nipple stimulation increases your oxytocin hormone, which uh, is the contraction hormone that helps push the milk down and out. And it also uh, peaks your prolactin levels, which is beneficial for longer-term milk production. Um, the freestyle pump is really my top pick because it's so small. It's, it's about, it's about the, um, the size and weight of, well, Cindy and I were trying to determine what it was like. So I, I said maybe um, a, a can of soup. Uh, but it is, it's, a, it's about the size of a, of a large can of tuna fish, and uh, it can hook to your belt or your pocket, and you can walk around hands-free uh, with the freestyle. It has an internal battery, so I just think in terms of the portability um, and the fact that you can program it to do your own pro, uh, pumping program, that would be my top choice. Uh, the Pump and Style Advanced is the most popular breast pump in the United States, and um, it, is a, you know, it is a long-time favorite, a very trusty pump. Uh, and a lot of people choose the Pump and Style Advanced. And then uh, the Symphony Pump is a hospital-grade rental, and um, it's really uh, not a cost-saving uh, concern when somebody decides that they might want to rent a pump rather than purchase one, because if you're going to rent a pump for, uh, for three or six months, by the end you end up, it, the cost is about the same. So you don't necessarily save money by renting, but what you're renting is actually a far uh, higher quality pump. But they're not really designed to be easy portability. Um, so you can commute with a symphony, but it's not, it's not your most commute favorite uh, friendly pump. Okay, so now we're getting ready to pump, and uh, we've got to start off by keeping your pump parts clean. And uh, you really want to think of your pump parts like uh, in the household, like a fork or a coffee mug. You don't sterilize those things with every use, but you certainly do wash them and keep them clean. And if you're pumping for a healthy baby in the community, like you're pumping at home for your baby or at work, then household clean is clean enough. You don't sterilize your coffee mugs. You don't boil your forks routinely. Sometimes when you're in a rush, you might even rinse them and reuse them. So uh, you always want to start off with 
clean hands and uh, wash any breast pump equipment that comes in contact with the milk in hot soapy water, just regular dish soap and a bottle brush. So that good old friction and surfactant, it's just like washing your hands with soap and water, is the best way to clean your pump parts. Uh, rinse them well. You can do a second rinse, shake off all the water, and let them air dry. They can dry on a bottle rack, on a clean paper towel, uh, on a clean dish towel. Uh, for a deeper clean, you can use the microwave steam clean bags, which essentially autoclaves. So you put the pump parts and the bottles in these Ziploc specialty Ziploc bags, add a certain amount of water, put them in the microwave for three minutes, and it creates steam. So it essentially autoclaves the pump parts. And that's a very quick and easy way of sterilizing. Um, now the tubing I just want to mention, because um, any breast pump, whether it's a closed system pump or an open system pump, if, you're, if the pump is running and you tilt the bottle just the right way or just the wrong way, depending on how you look at it, you can get milk backed up into the tubing. So you do want to take care of your tubing, um, and my recommendation is on a weekly basis, maybe uh, you know once a week on Sunday, for example. You disconnect the tubing, you coil it up and put it in a bowl of soapy water, let the water run through the tubing. Uh, flush it through by holding one end of the tubing under the running faucet and, and the other end toward the drain. So you're rinsing out all the soap suds and then hold one end of the tubing and lasso it over your head and by sonic visual force all the water will zip out and then you can just let it hang over a chair to finish drying. So if you, if you um, just keep an eye on your tubing for condensation or for milk backup, um, aside from that, all you need to do is wash your tubing once a week and keep an eye on it, and uh, you don't have to worry about any uh, anything yucky growing in there. Okay. Nancy, quick question. Um, Someone just asked. Yes, ma'am. Quick question. Yes. Someone just asked, how do you clean the valves? The the yellow and white valves. Okay, so um, when you are doing a good job cleaning your pump parts, you want to take everything apart. So you can see in the picture here, um, everything is disconnected. So uh, often the flange and the connector are two separate pieces. So if they are, you take those apart and wash each piece separately. The yellow and white valve come off the clear connector. Um, and the little white piece is, I call that with a contact lens. You can just put that in the palm of your hand and wash it with your finger with soap and water. Pinch it between your fingers to rinse it off. And then um, wash the yellow valve with the nipple attachment of the, of the bottle brush. So a good bottle brush has a thick end that goes inside the bottles and a thin end that is more like a, like a thick pipe cleaner, and that gets in all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, I always recommend once you finish washing the yellow and white valve, you snap it back together because those, those little suckers love to go down the drain. And uh, the problem with those is if the disposal gets them and kind of chews it up a little bit, then you do need to replace it because if the, um, again, like a contact lens, if the little white plastic valve is torn or nicked, uh, it will affect the, the, um, the working of the pump. You won't have uh, as good vacuum. That was a good question. I like that people are concerned about keeping each part clean. So there are some shortcuts. Um, and um, you know, I, I mentioned these uh, not necessarily with endorsement, but just letting parents know that um, thousands and thousands of, of parents all over the country do take care of their pump parts this way uh, and don't find problems. So if you're pumping for a healthy baby in the community and you're pumping multiple times a day at home, for example, sometimes moms will just refrigerate and reuse their pump parts several times in a row, and then at the end of the day they'll do a, a good washing. Uh, in the workplace, that can actually be quite a good time saver. So if in between your pumping sessions you put your, uh, your flanges and your connectors and so on right back in a Ziploc bag and put your milk and your pump parts all together in a bag in the refrigerator in your office, then you can take them out again two or three hours later and pump a second time, pump a third time, and then take everything home and wash it very well. And if you don't have access to a refrigerator at work, that's okay too. Use a cooler bag, and my favorite cooling source in a cooler bag is to take uh, two or three one-liter water bottles, fill them most of the way up to the top, and freeze them solid overnight, and then put those in your cooler bag. And that will keep everything cold, your milk, your pump parts. You can, um, you can put a sandwich in there for lunch. And then gradually during the day, as you're in and out of the bag to get your pumping gear, uh, the, the frozen water bottles will begin to thaw, and you'll have some ice water to drink as well. Um, so it's fine if you don't have access to a refrigerator. A big cooler bag like that one with uh, a couple of one liter water bottles frozen solid will keep your milk perfectly cold, and that's the equivalent of a refrigerator. Um, hand sanitizer is also handy at work because uh, if, you, if you're pumping, sometimes people have a private place to pump, but it may not have an electrical outlet and it may not have a sink. 
So if you're pumping in a in a uh, closet somewhere, um, just having your hand sanitizer in your pumping bag is helpful too. And I'm going to provide a, a helpful list at the end um, of things that you might want to consider packing. And just as a reminder, um, you can see how vulnerable babies in the NICU are. Um, there's a lot of tubes and a lot of IVs, and they have a lot of hygiene reasons. Uh, particularly for that reason. So if you're pumping for a sick baby or immunocompromised baby, if they tell you they need you to follow a very special um, uh, milk storage protocol, then that's what you do. Okay, so getting ready to get started. Um, so maybe you've had your baby, you've gotten breastfeeding established, you've had a few bumps in the road, you've got some support, you've got some help. Now your baby is two or three weeks old and you're thinking, okay, I think I'm ready to get started. That's kind of what I would recommend. So first get the breastfeeding going and when your baby is about three or four weeks old, that's actually a good time to begin thinking about pulling out the pump and starting to dabble in pumping. Um, I think that uh, you want to pump once a day in the morning after your baby eats. So the baby should really come first. First you breastfeed and then you pump. And you may not get a whole lot of milk initially, and that's okay. Uh, sometimes people say that they were told or they read to try to, to, try to time a pumping session in between uh, two breastfeeding sessions. But babies aren't always predictable, and I find that often backfires. It's also hard to figure out when you can get your baby down in the sleep somewhere so that you have time to pump. That seems to rarely happen. Either your baby will be down or asleep, but rarely both. Um, so think of pumping as an extension of the breastfeeding session. First you'll breastfeed, then you double pump. And you can double pump while caring for your baby using one of these hands-free bras, and we'll talk more about that. Disconnect the tubing and put the flanges with, the, with a half an ounce or an ounce of milk in each container in the fridge. And then, and then uh, several hours later, after another breastfeeding session, do the same thing all over again. So you can pump a second time in the same collection set on top of the same milk and um, maybe do that two or three times throughout the day after breastfeeding. So baby comes first, pump comes second. By the end of the day, you may have a total combined uh, two ounces or three ounces or maybe even more, and that can go in a milk storage bag in the freezer or that can go in a bottle in the refrigerator. So again, thinking about starting with the pump around three to four weeks and then introducing the bottle shortly after uh, is probably optimal timing if it's important to you that the baby accept the bottle and your goal is to begin to build up your milk, su your milk supply. So here you see um, uh, some examples of pumping after breastfeeding and how the heck do you fit it in. So it's not unlikely that you finish feeding and if you're trying to put your baby down in the Moses basket or the bassinet, your baby immediately realizes that you're trying to put him down and wakes up and fusses. So uh, instead of trying to p wait until the baby is down and asleep, Instead, get into a routine where you're pumping each day around the same time. Mornings usually work best. Nurse on one breast. Take your baby off and burp her. Put her back on the same breast and then use breast compression to finish the feeding. So essentially you're doing one long deep feeding on one breast, then double pump. So you may say, well, why double pump? The baby just, just nursed really long and well on one side. Why not pump the other side? Um, but my suggestion is to get into the habit of double pump hands-free, hands-on. So using one of these fabulous nursing bras that hold the flanges in place, it's a, a, special, a special type of a pumping bra, I should say, uh, that's really the best way to go because your hands are available to tend to your baby and your hands are available to do massage and compression, which is really important, and um, that gradually you're going to be able to build up milk production. And when you are starting to to pump on a regular basis, really what we're asking your body to do is to increase production basically 20%. So if your daily goal is to try to put three or four ounces of milk away in the refrigerator or the freezer beyond what your baby is regularly taking, it may take your, your body four or five or six or seven days to kind of get the message to increase production. But the best way to do that is to try to eke out another drop of milk more than your body has readily available. So if you're breastfeeding and then you're expressing right after breastfeeding, you may be able to collect uh, a small volume of milk, but it's the drop after drop after drop that you're coaxing out of your body that's sending an important message to the brain to increase that production. So get used to hearing me say this double pump, hands-free, and hands-on, because really that is the way to pump. And uh, it helps you um, 
again, it helps you because you can be multitasking, whether it's caring for your baby or dangling a toy or showing them a board book, or you could be typing or you could be eating if you were at work. Um, but by getting into a routine, you're going to build production, avoid washing the collection bottles, um, try that massage, that hands-on pumping, which means hands on your breast, just doing massage and compression. If you're prone to block ducts, um, then definitely massage and work on the areas that you tend to get blocked ducts. And remember that there's a lot of uh, milk making tissue up under towards your armpits. So always do some massage that's up under your armpit and stroking down toward the breast as well. You don't need to massage your breasts the whole time you're pumping at all, but periodically uh, during your pumping session you're going to want to reposition the flanges and do some massage as well. Um, and here's just a good example. I don't necessarily recommend bathing your toddler while you're pumping, but um, again, this is why I like this combination of the freestyle pump and the Simple Wishes hands-free pumping bustier. Um, if I were she, I would probably be standing at the kitchen counter stuffing my face, but I would be having the freestyle pump hooked to my waistband uh, or the convenient belt that it comes with. And um, uh, some women, I can't quite picture it, but some women tell me that they, uh, they stand at the, kitchen, at the uh, bathroom counter and they blow dry their hair or they put on their makeup in the morning while they're pumping, while they're getting ready for work. Um, but I certainly know a lot of people who put the freestyle on their waistband and walk from room to room uh, or just you know, take care of, of small tasks while they're pumping using the, the hands-free bustier. Okay, so here's some tricks of the trade in terms of pumping technique. Um, there are some particular things that you can do given the function of your pump that can make things work a little easier for you. The three pumps that you see here, and in order, there are the freestyle, uh, the pump and style advanced, and your faceplate may look a little different, but um, if, it, if it's a square pump that looks something like that, it's a pump and style advanced, uh, or one of the Symphony rental pumps. They all have this uh, special Medela technology, which is a two-phase rhythmic uh, technology. So many of you know this, you turn the pump on and it's going to cycle rapid and shallow for two minutes. So it basically does about 100 to 110 cycles a minute, short kind of staccato little um, suck releases. And that's intended to help the milk let down. And then all on its own, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to push the, uh, the let down button or anything like that. You can just ignore it and let the pump do its thing all on its own after two minutes. Uh, the pump will shift into a longer, slower, deeper draw, and that's called the milk removal uh, phase. And so um, the Medela pumps do this automatically. One little trick that I'll mention to you is uh, halfway through your pumping session, you can push the let down button a second time, and it will shift back and do another two minutes of that rapid and shallow, and then it will shift all on its own again into the milk removal phase. And some women find that toggling back and forth between the stimulation and the milk removal phase actually yields additional milk letdowns and additional milk. So that's definitely a technique that you can practice and see if that helps you. Um, if you don't have one of these types of pumps that have this two-phase pump technology, you can try to mimic it uh, as best you can by uh, turning the cycling speed fast while the vacuum is a little bit lower. And then after two minutes of that, you can turn um, the cycling speed slower but increase the vacuum strength. In terms of comfort while you're pumping. Um, pumping should not hurt. And uh, one thing I always focus on is the flange, because flange size matters just like your shoe size matters. You want to have shoes that are comfortable to walk in, and you want to have flanges that fit you. And you can't measure your nipples. And um, even the picture that's on the side of the packaging uh, that comes with the flanges I think is a little bit uh, challenging for moms to look at and try to figure out. The bottom line when it comes to the flange is, um, is it, it, do you feel like your nipple is being rubbed or abraded in the tunnel? Um, and if so, try a little dab of olive oil. But um, otherwise, um, well, let's see. I'm going to go to this slide first, and then I'll come back to the technique one. So you can see um, the pair of hands here is holding uh, the flange, which comes off the connector, and the flange comes in six different sizes, just like women come in different sizes. So um, if you find that you have to push the flange deeply into your breast tissue and squeeze your breast tissue in order to get the milk to flow, you almost certainly need a larger flange. If you feel like your nipple is being rubbed or abraded and is getting sore from, from pumping, then three questions to ask are, are you pumping for too long a period of time? 
I would say on average, most women pump for somewhere between uh, 10 to 12 or 12 to 14 minutes in that range. It's okay if you pump for a shorter amount of time as long as you're collecting the volume of milk that you want or expect. Um, and some women are outliers, of course, and might say, well, I pump for 20 minutes, but I get a lot more milk if I do, so okay. But in general, uh, some of the sorest nipples I've seen were moms that said, um, well, the baby, the baby nursed for 40 minutes, so I thought I needed to pump for 40 minutes. And the baby, you know, comes on and off and changes their sucking rhythm, and then they burp and, and so on. And, you know, they're latching and, and delatching several times. But the pump is just a machine that sucks and releases. So um, you generally uh, don't need to pump for as long as your baby nurses. And in general, again, I would say uh, if you're pumping after breastfeeding, then you're probably going to pump for something like 10 to 12 or 12, uh, 8 to 10 or 10 to 12 minutes. If you're pumping instead of breastfeeding, like at work, um, then probably you'll pump for somewhere between 10 to 14 minutes. And um, in the workplace, you may, you may need to just fit pumpings in when you can. So for example, if you can have a, just a short pumping break in the morning, if you have a, a longer break in the afternoon, then you may pump for, for 15 or 18 minutes uh, in the afternoon when you have more time because you could only pump for eight minutes earlier or something like that. And just getting back to the uh, flange, um, I want to comment on another helpful pumping technique that might help you yield more milk when you're pumping. In the first picture, you can see uh, the, the, this is mimicking uh, what it would be like on your breast, and the thumb is kind of um, you know, bullseye there. So usually when people sit down to pump, they center the flange like a bullseye on their nipple, and that's fine. But periodically through your pumping session, make a very small, slight adjustment to the angle that the flange is approaching your nipple so that in, in other words, it seems like your nipple is pointing in a different direction. So you see in the middle picture, it looks like the nipple is kind of pointing up, but you can see now that there's going to be more compression on the bottom of the areola. And then in the final picture, you see just the opposite, moving the flange so now it seems like the nipple is kind of pointing down, and you'll see a lot more compression going on at the top of the areola. So you really can't shift the angle of your nipple. What you do is you shift the angle of the flange, and you don't need to stop the pump or take off your bustier to do that at all. It's just a very simple, quick um, uh, shift of the flange. So pointing off pumping off center can be very uh, beneficial and you may find toward the midway or toward the tail end of your pumping session when you start moving the flange a little bit and pumping off center uh, that all of a sudden the, the pumping uh, flow seems to pick up again. Um, don't pump off center or with your nipple up against the side if it hurts. I don't want anybody at home gooding their teeth in pain saying, but Nancy said I should do this. Uh, so if it hurts, don't do it obviously. but. Um, but just shifting and trying different pump uh, nipple angles sometimes can really yield more milk. Um, and then finally, the olive oil is very helpful for, uh, for lubric lubrication, um, and it can reduce friction, and it's also a good skin conditioner. And a lot of times people will say that uh, they've been using lanolin. And I'll tell you three things about lanolin. It's really thick and sticky. It's not a great um, lubricant, and a small number of people are actually allergic to it. So, uh, even though it's a purified lanolin product, some people still seem to be hypersensitive to lanolin. So I've got no problem with lanolin um, you know, if, you, if you like to use it, but for the pumping purposes, I prefer olive oil. Okay, so some common issues that typically come up um, that questions people ask about some of these pumps. First of all, let me tell you that if you're pumping with a pump-in style, uh, the faceplate, which, which you see here, the faceplate over time sometimes wiggles a little bit loose. And if your pump starts to make a funny noise, whether it's a thunking or a thudding noise or a whistling noise, uh, or if you feel like you're losing vacuum, the faceplate is usually the first place I would look. And people don't always know this, but um, the pump itself is very strongly Velcroed into the bag. That It looks like it's built in, um, but most of the pump and styles are actually secured in there with some really strong Velcro. So if you decide to, you can put your hand right in there carefully and wiggle it out. Um, but at any rate, take the faceplate off. It, you just grasp one corner and pull, and the whole faceplate just comes off. Since you've taken it off, you might as well wipe behind there with a damp paper towel, um, and then you snap it back on in place and pay extra attention to snapping on at the four corners. And that will make the faceplate nice and tight again, and a lot of times that will cure the thumping and thudding noises. 
uh, and increase the, the, the suction. Um, and in terms of the tubing too, if you ever do get milk backed up into the tubing, usually moms notice that a long time before it goes all the way up the tubing. But if for whatever reason um, there's, some, there's wetness in the tubing and it goes all the way up to the faceplate, then that's okay. Stop the pump. And um, same thing, you're going to take off the faceplate, clean behind it. Um, people will say, oh, I hear milk can get into the motor. Take, take off the faceplate and look what's behind there. You, you cannot get into the motor there. There's a plastic diaphragm there, so you can wipe the plastic diaphragm side and you can wipe the faceplate side, and then everything is clean again, and you snap it back together, and then you wash the tubing the same way we talked about washing tubing. And remember, you can get milk backed up even in a closed system pump. Um, the important thing is that you keep your pump clean, whatever kind of pump you have. Uh, here's the valves, and we talked about these a few minutes ago. If your yellow and white valve is missing, if it's gone down the disposal and it's gotten too chewed up and nicked and, and torn, or if the little white piece is stuck to the yellow piece and not flapping easily, you will lose suction in your pump. So sometimes people turn the pump on and they've got no vacuum and they panic and then they look closely and they see that they didn't uh, put the yellow and white valves on their connectors when they put their pumping kit together. So that's something just to check. Um, and then I just want to put a word in about batteries versus um, plugging into the wall or the vehicle lighter adapter. Uh, another reason why I really like the freestyle pump is because it has an internal battery that you can charge up overnight and then you can pump for several days or even a full week uh, without recharging. I think it's something like three or four hours worth of pumping, which is a lot of pumping. Um, so an internal battery is nice, but the pump and styles um, use uh, a battery pack that's, trip, that's AA batteries. And batteries over time begin to lose their power. Before they completely poop out, they just start getting a little bit slower. So you may not realize that you're starting to lose efficiency, but whereas the pump maybe was supposed to be cycling at 60 cycles a minute, maybe it's actually you know, now cycling at, at 45. So it's starting to lose efficiency, and you'll notice it in your milk supply, but you may not realize it's the pump's power source. So I would just say in general, try to avoid running your pump and style on batteries unless you really need to because it will chew through a lot of batteries and you'll lose power and function before you realize it. Instead, uh, bring your power cord and try to plug into a, a wall or an extension cord when possible. And for people that do travel a lot or pump in their car, uh, the vehicle lighter adapter is handy for that because you can mainline right into the car battery, which is a lot more strong than, um, than uh, four or six AA's. Okay, so here's of course the question everybody wants to know. Um, how can I increase my milk supply? And um, I do have some super quick and easy secrets for you. And here they are. Oh, sorry, no I don't. Because as we really know, there's really no way to cut corners when it comes to milk supply. The key thing here is that you're pumping early and often if the baby isn't nursing. And if the baby is nursing, you're nursing your baby frequently. Um, and emptying the breasts eight times, you might, you might wonder, what is the eight ball about? Really, that's my symbol for uh, thorough milk removal eight times in 24 hours. That really does seem to be the research-based magic number uh, to initiate and then maintain full milk production. So uh, a breastfed baby may nurse uh, seven or eight or nine times or 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 times in a 24-hour period. Uh, if you are relying on a breast pump to initiate or maintain milk production, it seems like eight times in 24 hours is a, is a good uh, baseline. And uh, typically that means every two to three hours during the day and every three to four hours at night. Um, but uh, the, the more you empty your breast, the more milk your breast knows it's supposed to make. And then here's the question people will ask, well, which works better? And um, some people say, I, I heard that a pump always works better than the baby. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, the baby always works better than the pump. And some people um, say, oh, I think I'll, I can pump to see how much milk the baby is getting. And you know, the reason, the, the answer to this question, which works better, is uh, it depends. You know, I've certainly seen plenty of babies that seem like they're nursing very nicely. Um, and uh, mom will say, I don't know why she's not gaining weight. She nurses for 45 minutes. You know. Uh, uh, 10 times a day, but essentially the baby is uh, suckling and dozing and really not transferring a whole lot of milk. And uh, after two or three weeks of that, mom's milk supply has decreased to a point that there's not a whole lot of milk to transfer either. Um, so when a baby is, uh, is healthy and vigorous and lasts well and mom's milk supply is strong, uh, the baby is going to do a beautiful job removing milk from a breast. 
but in the event that the baby is not there or is not able to do it, um, then the pump may need to, to uh, take that job. So um, one way to increase milk production is what's called power pumping, pumping after breastfeeding. Because as I mentioned, by eking out another drop and another drop and another drop from a breast that doesn't have a whole lot of milk uh, left to share, it does send a hormonal message to the brain to increase milk production overall. And if you're just getting started pumping and you're pumping small volumes because your milk supply is nicely in tune with the baby's needs and now we're introducing another hungry mouth to feed, in other words, the pump, then um, pumping after breastfeeding once, twice, maybe three times uh, at various points during the day over the course of, of uh, four or five or six days is going to begin to increase your milk production. And bit by bit, you will be able to store up a little more milk and a little more milk and a little more milk until uh, by the end of the day you do have perhaps three or four ounces total of milk in the, in the bottles combined, and that can go in a milk storage bag or in a bottle to introduce the bottle. Sometimes people will ask, what about these things? People said I should try oatmeal or lactation cookies or dark beer or I should drink a gallon of water a day or what about fenugreek? So there's a, uh, acupuncture. There's a lot of, um, of suggestions out there. They do, they do uh, change with trend. So uh, right now uh, lactation cookies and muffins and oatmeal is very popular. Um, dark beer has always been, you know, in the, in the past 20 years, has always been one that's recommended. I will tell you when it comes to, to beer, um, it's the hops in the beer that people are referring to as a potential uh, milk booster. And um, so a Corona really doesn't count, and um, alcohol does not help. So uh, really we're looking for a non-alcoholic dark beer, and that just doesn't sound very fun to me. I would kind of go for the oatmeal cookies and skip the beer. Um, water to thirst, but don't force it. Some people have good results with acupuncture. If you've had acupuncture before and it's something that you're interested in and you like, you may want to look at acupuncture. I would say that um, fenugreek and mother's milk tea are probably the most common uh, herbal uh, uh, remedies that people go to at the health food stores. Uh, More Milk Plus is another reputable one. These are all considered safe to try. And then a newer one that we still don't uh, have a lot of research on but is believed to be safe is called Golacta, and um, I think that's primarily available mail order. Uh, and then there are some prescription medications, um, but those are, are rarely used, and I certainly uh, wouldn't, wouldn't go to um, a prescription medication to increase milk production uh, without um, going through many other methods first. Okay, so talking a little bit about bottle feeding, introducing the bottle, feeding the baby bottles, especially perhaps a baby who ends up getting quite a few bottles, like maybe a baby that's going to be in daycare five days a week. Um, how can we feed the baby but still protect the breastfeeding? And uh, there's a lot of bottles on the market, and many of them do market that uh, they're designed to fool the baby or to be just like mom and so on. And uh, it's just not that easy to feel, fool a baby. Take a look at, at what's going on here. It's such a tactile experience. Um, and it's a relationship. And, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's nothing that's going to be mimicked by a bottle. Um, some of the bottle nipples are such what we call super stimulus. They're so present in the baby's mouth, and uh, some of them also flow very rapidly with any type of gum or uh, lip or cheek or tongue movement. So all the baby basically has to do is nudge with their mouth, and their mouth fills with milk. Um, we've got to be careful about that because when the baby comes to the breast, the breast is not going to work like a bottle. And if the baby is getting a lot of milk very quickly and very easily from the bottle and then they come to the breast and they need to suck and wait and suck and wait and stimulate the milk to let down and then they need to be an active participant the whole time they're feeding, sometimes they begin to get a little bit fussy. So you will see sometimes um, after babies have had several bottles, they come to the breast and they, they seem fussier. Um, and I think, you know, one of the uh, scarier things is uh, what can become a downward spiral where the baby fusses at the breast and then mom goes and reaches for the bottle and gives the baby the bottle and the bottle is, it, the baby's happy and then mom begins to worry that her supply is, isn't adequate or that the baby prefers the bottle. So I think um, the main thing is uh, to, to 
feed the baby in ways that are going to um, not, not throw a monkey wrench into the breastfeeding. This is what we don't want to see. So take a look at what's going on with the baby's mouth here. Um, the baby's uh, lips are tight and pursed. The, the bottle nipple uh, in the bottom picture, the baby is gumming the bottle nipple, chewing it with his gums. Um, lips are tight, the jaw is not dropped, and uh, those are not going to feel good at the breast when the baby comes back. Take a look at what's going on here. This is a much better way to bottle feed. Use the bottle to get the baby to open their mouth wide. Give the baby the bottle, let it be invited in, and aim for the roof of the mouth so the tongue goes underneath it. Look at the middle picture, how the baby's mouth is open nice and wide and the, the jaw is dropped uh, and the lips are flanged out. And then um, in the bottom picture, which is the Calma um, bottle, they call it a feeding device, but, um, but this, this uh, innovative nipple, the point with this one is that the baby really does need to be an active participant throughout the whole feeding. If they just move their lips or their gums or compress, the milk will not release. Uh, the baby has to actively suck the whole time, which is actually how the baby gets milk at the breast. So the baby at the breast is not going to remove milk unless he's actively sucking. Um, and that is the way the comma has been designed too. Uh, and um, it actually helps by taking a little bit longer to drink the bottle, uh, what I call the slow, the slow food movement. So it really should take a good 15 to 30 minutes to take a full bottle feeding. Um, and uh, the bottle nipple that you choose has a lot to play with that. Um, and then the final picture here of a dad looks like um, bottle feeding his, his uh, baby there. Look at the angle of the bottle in relationship to the baby. It's horizontal. So the nipple should be filled with milk, but the bottle almost horizontal. And that is what's called a paste responsive feeding, having the baby be upright, having the bottle come in almost horizontal. Um, and in that way, the baby is not a passive recipient under this heavy flow of milk because again, that's what can cause problems. If the baby is sitting in front of a fire hose or opening their mouth to a waterfall uh, of milk and um, the bottle will release milk instantly and, um, and constantly, then when the baby comes to the breast, he's going to protest. He's going to say, why do I have to work so hard? Why do I have to wait so long? Um, and if your response is obviously something's going wrong with the breastfeeding, I better reach for a bottle, pretty soon you can get into this downward spiral scenario where the baby's fussing more and more at the breast, so they're getting more and more bottles, which perhaps was the initial problem to begin with. And also, if you're not pumping, that's also going to begin to have a downward spiral effect on milk supply, which makes the whole situation even more compounded. So. Um, Again, you know, just to, to talk about how do you get out of that situation, you need to you want to be bottle feeding with the slowest flow nipple and something that doesn't teach the baby bad breastfeeding behavior. So no tight mouth, uh, no gumming the nipple to control the flow. Um, choose something like the comma or any slow flow nipple that's going to allow your baby to open wide uh, and have the lips turned out, and it really should take almost half an hour to do a full bottle feeding. And that way the baby's brain has time to realize their belly's being fed too. Babies have a very high sucking need. So if they're, if they're spending uh, eight minutes sucking back three ounces of milk, I would not be surprised if they're still fussy at the end and the caregiver reaches for another two ounces of milk thinking the baby's still hungry. Maybe the baby's not still hungry, but maybe that same three ounces of milk, if it had taken uh, 25 minutes instead of eight, would have been ever so much more satisfying. So that's what I mean by the slow food movement. Okay, so sometimes we have a rough situation where the baby uh, is refusing the bottle. And there's no promises, but my recommendation is once you start introducing a bottle uh, somewhere between weeks three to six, um, do one bottle feeding of expressed milk each day until it seems like the baby is catching on, and then you can switch to every other day when it seems to be going fairly smoothly, and then keep it up every other day. It doesn't have to be a full feeding. It's okay if it's just an ounce of breast milk. Say you're expressing four ounces of milk and you want to put most of it in the freezer, so you can give one ounce in the bottle and then finish that uh, feeding on the breast. But that way it stays familiar in the baby's environment, and um, that's your best bet at keeping it familiar. Uh, I find that the bottle-refusing situations 
are most common when there's been what I call a bottle vacation. So baby was taking the bottle early and did fine with it, um, and then you know, uh, partner was away on a 10-day business trip, so no one was there to give the baby a bottle, or family you know, went on a vacation and didn't bother, um, and so it's been a week or, or longer that the baby had a bottle, and then when they bring it back out, the baby refuses. Uh, so what do you do if your baby will not take a bottle? First of all, if, it, uh, if your baby is young, again, you know, sort of between that, that uh, uh, two to three month mark, I would change the time of day. It's most common that people try to have a partner give the bottle at the, at the, in the evening when partner comes home from work, um, and that may not be the best time of day for everybody. Nobody, nobody may, be ti- may be patient at that hour. So maybe switch to the morning when babies are often in a better mood and more receptive and everybody is calm and fresh. So instead of trying to do a bottle at 7.30 in the evening, maybe think about trying a weekend morning bottle. Um, I'm not generally too concerned with um, the warmth of milk. Some babies don't care if it's cold from the fridge or just the chill taken off uh, or if it's warm or lukewarm. But if your baby is refusing the bottle, then try to heat the milk. Uh, Not hot, but uh, a little on the warmer side. It seems like babies that uh, are, are very fussy about the bottle seem to do better when the milk is quite warm. Uh, this bottle feeding position that dad is using with the baby against his chest facing out with the bottle coming in really works well. So have your baby sitting up facing out against your chest as you walk around the house. Movement and distraction is the way to go. Um, also a novel distracting environment. So here mom has her baby outside. Uh, where the baby can look around and be distracted, and again, facing out with the bottle coming in. Bottom row, baby in the car seat. This is a little um, novel, uh, odd idea, but seems to work for some babies. I call it the disembodied arm. So you have something very distracting in front of the baby, maybe the television. I'm not advocating for the television, but this could work. Um, So the baby's in the car seat facing something distracting, and the parent is sitting behind the baby out of sight, and just the arm comes around with the bottle. So again, that's called the disembodied arm. Um, And then the trick that I find seems to work um, most often is to have mom offer the bottle and alternate back and forth between the breast or the bottle. So in the morning, uh, set up a bottle that's got maybe two ounces of warm milk and put it on the chair uh, next to where you're going to sit and breastfeed and then start off by nursing and let the baby get a few minutes of nursing and be relaxed and in that nice suck, swallow, breathe rhythm. Um, And then at a pause, sit the baby up and offer the bottle. And if the baby refuses, no problem. Don't make a fuss. You just put the bottle down and you put the baby back on the breast and maybe after another couple of minutes you try again. Uh, Take the baby off the breast and offer the bottle. So sometimes just going back and forth saying you can get milk here, you can get milk there, it's all milk, it's all good, sometimes that will work. Um, I did a whole hour on uh, introducing the bottle and um, covered a lot of the bottle feeding stuff in more detail. So if you want a lot more detail and particularly older babies that won't take the bottle, uh, I'll refer you to that webinar for full information. Okay. Um, expressing your and storing and transporting your milk is a good one. Um, I like this picture because to me it's a good representation of uh, the milk you bring to daycare. So uh, for a baby who is between three to five months or so, uh, it will be interesting for you to know that baby's breast milk intake essentially levels off and they don't keep requiring more and more milk. So again, sticking with the slowest flow nipple that the baby and the caregiver will tolerate, so the same three ounces or the same four ounces of milk does take 20 or 30 minutes for the baby to drink and is ever so much more satisfying. If you're living ounce to ounce, if you're working full time and you're just about keeping up and you're trying to keep your head above water and so on, um, sometimes people will decide to introduce or begin dabbling in solid foods around five, five and a half or five and a half to six months. So if your baby is interested and takes to it, you can choose the high value solid foods um, and start close to six months. And as the baby is interested, uh, just keep advancing volume wise on the daycare days. Uh, let the caregiver feel like they can give the baby as much uh, you know, pureed avocado uh, and oatmeal as the baby seems to want. That makes the caregiver feel like she's got plenty of food to offer the baby in addition to the breast milk bottles. But your baby may not ever need more than four or five ounces of milk in a bottle. Breastfed babies or breast milk fed babies do generally not graduate to these six, seven, and eight ounce uh, uh, volumes of milk in one sitting. Okay. Um, so in daycare, typically, 
uh, three bottle feedings and then um, a half of a bottle feeding, which is what I call a snack pack. So somewhere probably between uh, 14 to 18 ounces of milk as they get a little bit older. So starting off around uh, uh, 16 ounces of milk for a 10-hour day at daycare is a, is a pretty good estimate. Three full feedings and then um, a snack pack that's a little bit extra. Um, sometimes people will say, well, how much milk do I need to have in the freezer in order to go back to work? And then I liken that to, well, how much milk money do you have in the bank? Um, some people have a lot. Some people have a little. You need enough to get you through the first day of work, and everybody wants to have a little more padding than that. Um, when you're going back to work, though, the milk you pump on Monday is the milk the baby will eat on Tuesday, and the milk you pump on Tuesday is the baby's milk for Wednesday. So you're really only dipping into your freezer stash uh, when you're coming up short and in emergencies. And, and that does happen, but in general, you want to be providing your baby with freshly expressed breast milk and keeping up with their regular needs. So the freezer is really there um, when you need it, but you shouldn't be heavily relying on it, nor will you be thawing and using frozen milk on a daily basis. Um, you can easily transport your milk uh, to home or to daycare using um, a cooler bag with a, a cooler source in it. Uh, if you do travel for business, I did a, a blog on that, and um, I'll include the link in your email tomorrow. Um, but TSA does allow you to bring breast milk uh, in, in any amount with or without your baby. You do need to declare it, and believe it or not, they may check it for explosives, uh, but they don't, uh, they don't uh, disturb the milk, and they certainly don't ask you to taste it. Um, and um, they're quite accustomed to seeing uh, working moms and breast pumps and uh, breast milk with and without babies coming through security. They will hand it, inspect it. You don't have to send it through the x-ray machine if you don't want to. Uh, milk will change in, in its appearance. Um, uh, sometimes it will be much ye more yellow, sometimes a little greenish, sometimes it will look like skim milk, and it's normal for your milk to separate in the refrigerator because it is not homogenized, and uh, the cream the fat will rise to the top and it's sticky. And uh, so all you need to do is uh, hold the bottle under warm running water for 10 or 15 seconds and then the fat will swirl right back into the milk. Okay. Uh, and you can thaw the milk in a slow thaw method by taking it out of the freezer and putting it in the refrigerator overnight and it will take about 12 hours to thaw. Or you can take it directly from the freezer and put it in a bowl of warm water or in a bottle warmer, but do not put the milk in the microwave even on defrost, and don't put it in boiling water because that uh, can destroy some of the immune properties of the breast milk. Um, and the bottom line with breast milk, the golden rule is if it looks okay, smells okay, and the baby will take it, assume it's fine. Uh, every source says something different. Every refrigerator magnet tells you five days, seven days, don't worry about it. If the milk looks okay, smells okay, and the baby takes it, it's fine. In general, breast milk is fine in the refrigerator for five to seven days, perhaps longer, and in the freezer, uh, six months, perhaps longer. Uh, what does off breast milk look like or smell like? It's like sour milk. It's chunky, and it doesn't blend back together, and it really smells bad. Okay, so we just have a couple more minutes. I want to um, talk quickly about pumping in the workplace. Um, you may have a lovely lactation room like this, or you may pump at your desk. Like you can see this uh, young woman on the right-hand side is using her uh, nursing cover-up, her baby Olay, and she's pumping right at her desk, which is what I call a pump opportunity. If you're getting on a long uh, conference call or you've got a boring meeting um, on a, on a uh, webinar or something like that, then you know, by all means, uh, pumping at your desk is a good opportunity with your hands-free bustier your hands are free and you can type or you can multitask. Do talk to your uh, manager or your human resources department before you're coming back so that you get the scoop on uh, what the plan is going to be. Uh, and now with the new legislation, there's certainly a lot more support uh, for you to make your, your case about taking some break time and having a location that's not a bathroom to pump. Um, I'm going to include this list in your, uh, in your email, but this is a, a handy list of, uh, of things that you'll want to bring with you. Um, and uh, here's a reminder that um, all of the breastfeeding support items are on sale right now through the 27th. Um, and uh, some of my favorite things, like uh, the My Breast Friend and um, the Freestyle Pump, which is a great deal. Um, I'm happy to make other specific recommendations. 
Um, I know that I would run out of time, but wait, there's more. Uh, every Thursday at 12 noon, I do this. Every Thursday at 12 noon, we have a webinar, and um, it's more interactive. I read out various questions, and I answer them. This Thursday, I'm excited to talk about poop, um, and uh, it is our poop week. And Cindy said it's so exciting, it's like shark week. Um, but you can also listen to these webinars and view them. There's a lot of topics here uh, that I've done in recent weeks, and these are available to you to watch on demand at no charge. And uh, thank you. Thank you for attending. You. Cindy, do you want to say thank you? Yes. Let me just pop back to that slide just so I can uh, say that since we are at the end of our hour and we unfortunately weren't able to get to some of the questions here, um, I did indicate and posted a link a couple of times that we can. Uh, Nancy is going to uh, push poop to the second half hour of her chat. <laughs> this week. And the first half hour will take your any overflowing questions from this uh, webinar. So come see us Thursday at noon Eastern. Um, we're there every Thursday. So anytime you have oh, a question you can come. We are we always there. We have a good there. time. It's a lot more we do. It's and fun. we a lot more. <laughs> we do. We do. And it's a, it, it's, uh, it's a nice casual fun place to be. Everybody who is everybody is at our chat. So um, she'll be taking your, your overflow questions um, at the chat on Thursday and any Thursday you want to come. And again, like she mentioned, there's a lot of these topics on demand. Uh, the links are available on that same link um, that we've been posting about the chat. So um, anyway, we would like to thank you, Nancy, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Um, please check your email for the recording. Um, it should be sent out within 48 hours. So just check your inbox and you'll get a recording. Um, it will also be posted to our website. And we're going to include an information sheet with um, all those links that we've been posting. So if you missed some or couldn't get to it, um, we will include those in, in that email for you and that list, uh, that packing list that Nancy sort of uh, teased up there and, and gave you a sneak peek. And, um, but I just want to thank Nancy for sharing all this valuable information with our audience. And thanks to everyone for attending. And we hope to see you at another ISIS online event soon. Thank you.